basically what's what we have here is Nathan went through and he put together the doctrine of Christ. He found the doctrine of Christ and he's piecing it together in the Bible. And then what I've been doing is I kind of was led down um, another path along that way, which was really neat because Jeff just mentioned something in his prayer that was really beautiful. And he said, you know, the words um, of those who uh, are ancient, which was really significant to what we're going to start off talking about here. I'm just going to give a little introduction and then Nathan will take it from there. So the doctrine of Christ, this is my doctrine that all men must come unto me for of such is the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 19, 14. And we're going to outline that. Nathan's going to go into more detail on outlining that in the Bible. But first, I thought it was really important to touch on a few things in relation to the Bible and what our understanding of the Bible actually is. Um, so these are some of the points that we're going to go through. We're going to start, start with the Bible, go through the doctrine of Christ, the condemnation, how we connect back to the fathers after that condemnation, baptism of the promise, seeking Christ, and then to gather. So there's a lot of references to um, lost books, Apocrypha, or Dead Sea Scrolls. And so can anybody see my screen? Is no one able to see it? There we go. Sorry, you guys. So the lost books, Apocrypha, Dead Sea Scrolls, um, the, some people have an idea of what they are, but in reality, kind of all just, oh, it's stuff that somehow associates with uh, the Bible in some way or another. Basically, Apocrypha means um, older texts that in some way were written around the time or at, at some point were connected with biblical writings, but are not now considered a part of the actual canon, um, modern day canon. So you've got the lost books. Most people don't realize there's over 500 books that are considered lost books from the modern biblical canon. And what's really crazy about that is you know that um, Nephi himself says plain and precious things were taken away. When it first, when the words first proceeded from the mouth of the Jews, they were plain and precious and easy to understand. However, uh, after time, wicked and conniving and evil men, uh, stole away those plain and precious truths and they became hard to discern and hard to understand and so that's why you see when people go to the bible they have such a hard time pinpointing certain um concepts or uh pillars of the doctrine of christ and you have so many different offsets okay we all know that from you know the story of, of joseph smith and how he's seeking and each of us as we seek uh the truth and the gospel of jesus christ about five years ago, I became interested in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I bought a book that kind of, a couple books, one of them followed a journalist that traveled down to some of the caves, the Kwan Caves, where these scrolls were found, and read some of the things about them. Um, my husband took me to go see some of them when they were on display, and I really loved it. I thought it was so neat, and it just piqued my interest, and I started searching other books that maybe had a connection to the Bible. Um, now, at the time when I did that, you could Google, you know, books, you know, no longer in the Bible or whatnot, and you'll come up with all sorts of stuff. We all know about the Nicene Creed, the um, group of, of church leaders at the time who came together and decided what was and wasn't the word of God or what where the um, term Trinity came from, you know, from the Bible and, and many other things. So then that, that didn't just happen once, it happened a lot of times. And so when I Googled and, you know, just was researching, I was able to come up with, I think it was 25 or 30 books and I actually started reading a few of them. And today, if you go in and search, what's really interesting, I'm, I won't pull it up right now, but if you just want to get a kick, search how many books have been taken from the Bible or what are the lost books um, that are no longer in the Bible? Your first 50 responses will say no books have ever been removed from the Bible. There is nothing lost from the Bible that every, every, um, you know, fact checking website will tell you that the Bible is exactly as it should be. And nothing has ever been removed from it. I was shocked because just five years ago, I could easily go in and research and find all of these missing pieces, not all of them. I couldn't find all of them, but, um, as much as I was able to absorb at the time. And now you have to seek pretty diligently to find anything that will support it so that the, effort to 
diminish and take away from these pieces um, of the Bible are shocking. And then second part of this is we as a people tend to want an authority figure to tell us what to think and what to do. And that's really sad, but we, we do. It's really easy to have someone hand you a book and say, this is the word of God, go read it and you'll be fine. And unfortunately, that's our traditions. We're trying to get rid of these traditions. We're trying to get rid of these desires that we have to be controlled by men and instead go to the Lord, right? Um, so what happens is we, even though we can be told and we can know for a fact that there are books that were originally in the King James Bible, even that we have today, the ones that were on the shelves in the 1800s, just maybe 120 years ago, are completely different. 20 some books different than what we have today. And even though we know that, and even though we had a prophet in the 1800s who said the King James version of the Bible um, is the most correct translation, he was holding a very different Bible than what we hold today. Even though that's the case, we still have a hard time reading those and accepting them with the same um, veracity as we would accept those that are actually in our canon today. Why is that? That's because we want to accept the authority figure. We have a hard time stepping outside of our traditions. And then we have to use the gift of discernment and go to the Lord. And that takes so much more effort. We're lazy. We don't want to do that. So I really want to push on everyone, or I hope to maybe ignite the desire to understand why these books were taken out. So let's go back to Christ's time. You've got Satan who wants to destroy the true gospel. You've got Satan who wants to completely destroy um, and gut the doctrine of Christ. Well, what books would you take out? What could you actually get away with? So those books that were taken out either by conniving men or um, accidental you know, mistakes or um, reprints or, or whatever translation errors, do you think that those did matter? Or do you think those are probably super important books? Just consider that. If, if those are the ones that were taken out, and now Nephi says that it causes men to stumble, gee, shouldn't we be looking into those books? Shouldn't we be seeking and trying to figure out what's going on here? And, it, and those traditions that we have stop us from doing that. We're like, oh, but that's apocrypha. Oh, but the, you know, that's no authority is actually accepting that. We got to get, get rid of that. Because the reality is the majority of these books were in the canon or, or um, con co connected to it in a very significant way before the fourth century. And just, just significantly um, helped form the Christian understanding and doctrine before it was gutted. Um, and most of these came from all over different areas and all witness of each other and connect of each other. So why they're lost? Um, that's, that's one of the main reasons we talked about. Why would God let this happen to a sacred text? That's something that I wanted everyone to maybe consider for yourselves. Why? Um, it, it, it makes you think, well, it must not have been important if it was taken, but the reality is it was taken because it was so important and it wasn't being utilized or treated properly. All the apostles were being killed. Um, great and abominable churches were being set up. Uh, truths are lost when that happens. And we even see that in the 1840s. So sh um, should we read them? These are, I'm going to, I'm going to take you real quick. Let me stop this share. And I'm going to take you to a website that I, that I have to make this a little easier. Cause if you do try to search any of these things, it's going to be quite daunting. So let me pull up. What I have over here and we will. Um, let me share this again. Okay. So you can go to the lostbooks.org and it's kind of, there's a lot of different places you can go, but this is the most connected and most thoroughly embedded of all the places that I've seen that have um, really well organized and scholared articles and uh, um, reads on each of these. And so um, you've got the lost books. Um, this one's talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls, but you can go into, here's the list. I want you to look at this. I'll scroll through it really slowly. But this is pretty significant. If my internet wants to do it. <laughs> okay. So titles in blue have been found and translated. Titles with red means they're only available in print form. And titles with a strike through it means they're still lost. So they're referenced somewhere in the Bible, but 
we haven't found them yet. And let's start scrolling here. Look at this first one. You guys see what that says? The Book of Abraham. Isn't that cool? You guys know where the Book of Abraham is, right? <laughs> okay, so this is A's. These are books that start with A. Look at this. B. We've already gone through about 30 books. C, another 40. Look at this. Okay, so I'm just going to scroll through really quickly. Now, a lot of these are in the original form. So the manuscripts have been damaged. So when you go in and read them, there might be lines missing and or words mistranslated. But the whole point of me showing this is we know what's happened to this Bible, right? But today we have the technology and the ability to find and seek out and learn more than what we had 100 years ago, even 50 years ago. Are we taking advantage of that? And then if we are trying to find the new and everlasting covenant, the doctrine of Christ in the Bible, wouldn't it behoove us to utilize those things that Satan himself tried to destroy and take away? And so what Nathan's going to go into here, I'm still scrolling, just so you guys know that can't see this, we're still scrolling. I'm a T now, um, is we're going to show scriptural support for the doctrine of Christ, not only in the Old and New Testament, but also from these scriptures. And you'll see how they go hand in hand. And so this list that I just scrolled through that everyone's looking at, this is just um, the list that has that we have doctrinal sound um, translations that have been found. This isn't even the Dead Sea Scrolls and other apoc apocrypha. Um, and the Nag Hammadi Library has even more. So utilize what we have when you're teaching the doctrine of Christ and we're trying to understand the doctrine of Christ because the Lord has taught many people and he has given his word to all of his children and it's available today. So let's go back. Let me share this one again. Sorry, give me a second. All right. All right, Nathan, it's over to you. Okay, and so kind of just adding on a little bit of what she said, um, understanding the doctrine of Christ as found in the Bible extends the base on who you communicate this with. Um, for us, the Lord's asked us to move out here to Ohio where um, we've been meeting a lot of, you know, non-denominational and just, just really good Christian people. And what's been impressed my plan, upon my mind this last week is that the day of the Gentiles or the Latter-day Saints is coming to an end if it has not already. And so what we'll find is as we search out the, those who are prepared and are listening to the spirit, the Lord will place them um, in our path in, that, in essence. And so the scripture that comes to my mind is that everyone will hear the doctrine in their own language. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a physical thing as well. But a lot of these, these saints in these latter days love and understand the bible and if we can pull these scriptures out from the bible it speaks to their heart a little more clearly and so this what we put together is just something that we've taught over the last couple of days and it's and it's quite it's quite short and simple um but what we always start off with is that heavenly father is the same yesterday and to, and forever like that doesn't change um as found in, in the scripture in revelation there's actually a revelation quote that uh citations for that and help them understand that there is no disconnect from the path of ascension that perils those of our father and so most of us are aware that in malachi 4 5 6 ending the old testament it is said that i will send you elijah the prophet and he shall turn the hearts of the father to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers and what does this mean how do we understand this application because it surely needs to come to pass and simply the heart of the fathers is that covenant and that promise that was given to the father. And so salvation is purchased the same way Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob purchased it. And if we don't turn our hearts and our minds to our fathers and how they ascended to Christ, the earth will be smitten with a curse. And so what that means is if there's nobody on earth that is found with the blessings of our fathers, the earth has been wasted away. If no one receives the doctrine of Christ, 
no one receives their baptism of fire and baptism of the Holy Ghost, they won't be able to enter into the presence of the Lord and, and you know, make it into the millennium. And that's what we're trying to do here. And that price of redemption is purchased by Christ as he is advocated with our Father. And it states in 1 Timothy 2, 3, 5, our, our Savior who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. Man, did you stop sharing your screen? This might be a little more complicated, guys, because I'm I'm in a hotel right now. I was actually expecting to be home going through this, but um, if you can go to the next slide. Can I can I make a comment there real quick? So, I, I one of the things that was really important is the way that we understand the turning our hearts to the fathers and the fathers to the children is very different. So we're going to get into that later in a slide, but just consider that and, and let the spirit guide you as we go into that. Because as you share that with other people who have been taught this their whole lives, um, it's going to come as a shock. But if you let the spirit teach you how best to share this principle, it's going to make so much sense that it's going to overpower that shock that they're going to come across because the truth of it speaks for itself. And so what we understand as well from the scriptures is that we're all under condemnation. There's a, there's a distinct parallel between the Israelites, the Mormons, or you can refer to it as the church and the laws in which we live. Now, we are no different and no better than the Israelites of Moses' time. And so Moses taught this and he warned us against this. And I always ask the question, well, what was Moses trying to do? What was his, his big premise of trying to bring the, the children of Israel up Mount Sinai to dwell in the presence of the Lord? And what was their reaction? And typically, you'll get a response that, that parallels what we're doing today in the church. is We don't want to go up to the mountain because of how painful it is. We would much rather have a prophet to do that or a leader. And so Deuteronomy show, shows us this. And it reads, I stood between the Lord and you at the time to show you the word of the Lord, for you were afraid by reason of the fire and went not up into the mountain. And ye said, behold, the Lord our God hath showed us his glory and his greatness. And we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God doth talk with man. Right. We know that God talks with man and he liveth. Now, therefore, we should. Therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God anymore, then we shall die. They recognize their unworthiness and their inability to approach the Lord at this time. And so they call on Moses again. Go thou near and hear all that the Lord our God shall say. And speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee. And we will hear it and do it. Basically saying, we want a prophet. We want somebody to tell us what to do. And as you transition to the second page, babe, we'll just go to the next slide there. Because Mark lays this out in a way where it almost slaps us in the face. Um, but first you talk in Corinthians, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolish unto him, neither can they know them because they are spiritually discerned. Okay, so we have to have that willingness to be diligent to the word, to seek him in earnest prayer and scripture study. And then here's Mark's basically um, what he lays out before the church. He says, how be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for the doctrines, the commandments of man, for laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of man as the washing of pots and cups and many other sheep, many other such like things you do. And he said unto them, hold well, we reject the commandments of God that you may keep your own traditions making the word of God a none effect through your traditions, which you have delivered and many such like things do you do, do ye. So what is the church doing different than the Israelites? And the answer to that is, is, is nothing. We are uh, a parallel of that time. Like, like we keep mentioning, we have our idols that we place before us and God. And so I always invite and all of us, to include, our, to, to include myself, 
is to constantly look and search after what we place as idols. We all know full well from the account in, in Exodus that when Moses went up to the mountain, by the time he got down, they already had a golden image put, presented before them. They've already p- placed their idol, even though they've been very short time, you know, from, from the, the time in Egypt, and they're already going back to their traditions. We love these traditions. They're probably the hardest things for us to remove um, from our lives. And so as we seek out these things in our life, the Lord will guide us individually on what that is. And so if we can properly understand the state of of the church, we can begin to look at the scriptures a little more fully and understand the things that the scriptures talk about. We don't necessarily have, and that might be more of a tradition in our life rather than a, a, a doctrinal truth. Malia, did you have anything else to add there? Yes, and so something that's significant too, if you're trying to work with people who don't have the foundation of the restoration, starting with the biblical canon, the understanding of what has happened to it over the last 2000 years is so significant because when people see that, if they truly seek truth, they're going to accept it. They're going to go, oh my goodness, I don't hold this. Why would someone 200 years after Christ's death be held to um, a moral and um, commandment commandments at a different level than me in a biblical canon. That doesn't make any sense. Why would that be to them from their God, the words of God, but to me, it's not right. It, it doesn't make any sense. So once you can help, help someone understand what's happened to the scriptures in general, to all God's word through all religions over all time, that it's constantly corrupted and, and people tend to gut the new when our lasting covenant, the doctrine of Christ, the baptism of fire, um, and entering into that covenant with God, you s- help them understand that it's so much easier then to go, okay, now look, there's more scripture. So don't ever be turned off because this is, you know, harder to teach without that foundation because the foundation can easily be laid when you help them understand what's been lost from the Bible itself. And so under the condemnation, you've got, th- these are all, um, scriptures that are pulled from those books, those lists of books that I was showing you at the beginning. So this is the epistle of the apostles. And we asked him, Lord, shall such things be among us? And he answered us. This is Christ speaking. Fear not. It shall not be in many, but in few. We said unto him, yet tell us in what manner it shall come to pass. And he said unto us, there shall come forth another doctrine and a confusion. And because they shall strive after their own advancement, they shall bring forth an unprofitable doctrine. So this doctrine is not going to bring forth the fruits of the true doctrine of Christ, right? And therein shall be a deadly corruption of uncleanliness, and they shall teach it, and shall turn away them that believe on me from my commandments, and cut them off from eternal life. But woe unto them that falsify this my word and commandment, and draw away them that hearken to them from the life of the doctrine, and separate themselves from the government, from the commandment of life, for together with them they shall come into everlasting judgment. And then the Acts of John but the people rising up from off the floor went hastily and cast down the rest of the idol temple crying, the God of John only do we know and him hereafter do we worship since he hath had mercy on us. And as John came down from thence, much people took hold of him saying, help us. O John assist us that do perish in vain. Thou seest our purpose. Thou seest the multitude following thee and hanging upon thee and hope toward God. We have seen the way wherein we went astray when we lost him. We have seen our gods that were set up in vain. We have seen the great and shameful derision that came to them, but suffer us, we pray thee, to come unto thine house and be succored without hindrance. Receive us that are in bewilderment. And John said to them, men of Ephesus, believe that for your sakes I have continued and have put off my journey unto Smyrna and to the rest of the cities that there also the servants of Christ may turn to him. But since I am not yet perfectly assured concerning you, I have continued praying to my God and beseeching him that I should there depart from Ephesus when I have confirmed you in the faith. And whereas I see that this has come to pass and yet more is being fulfilled, I will not leave you until I have weaned you like children from the nurse's milk and have set you upon a firm rock. So both of these are showing Christ foretelling what's going to happen to his doctrine in the Bible itself. That it's going to be gutted. 
And then you've got John visiting people already. So these people already have the true gospel taught to them. And then John's there traveling and already they have fallen into apostasy. So some people that were following the Pharisees and Sadducees realize what they've been doing and they feel awful. And they're like, oh my goodness, we put away our gods. And then other people, which we see in, in the Bible towards the end, he's writing letters to correcting them going, hey, you're still screwing up. You, can't, you guys, come on. Because they're not going to the Lord for their revelation. Instead, they're, they're trying to figure things out on their own and come up with their own doctrine. So this condemnation, what you see, the separation and this gutting of the doctrine of Christ is testified of all throughout um, the lost books as well as the Bible. So next what we have is we have <clears throat> looking to our fathers. If we understand where we are at, we got to understand, well, what did the fathers teach? What were they trying to help the Israelites to do? What was the Sadducees and Pharisees withholding from the people that they were unable to properly see the Messiah when he came? And in Exodus, you have an example of what Moses was doing. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. And behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord hath made with you. And what is that covenant? And again, we read in Isaiah, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the mint thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. What does this turn into? And we read in Leviticus, if then, and here's your if then. So if we're able to do this, then what happens? If then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled and they then accept the punishment of their iniquity. Okay, as mentioned there in Isaiah. Then will I remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham. Will I remember that covenant that is placed before us individually has to be an individual covenant. Jacob couldn't rest on that of Isaac and Isaac couldn't rest on the covenant of Abraham. We go back to what Malachi said. And, I re, and we reiterate, what, is the, what does that mean? What is Malachi talking about when he's talking about the hearts turning to the fathers and the fathers to the children? If Jacob and Isaac were saved by their father, the Lord wouldn't have had to have made a covenant with Jacob and Isaac. We understand from Leviticus that that covenant needs to be made with each individual person. And that there is actually a path to that, to that ascension and how important it is when in the, in the New Testament that the baptism of fire and the baptism of the Holy Ghost is spoken of that we'll get to here shortly. And so moving and that's on. That's the biggest issue oh. that, sorry, Ann. that's the biggest issue that you see with the Jews in Christ's time is they, they have this promise of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they don't understand the significance of the spiritual side of that promise. They think it's a, a very carnal remember this is a carnal people who need the carnal law so of course they're going to interpret the scriptures carnally so they're taking um, a very spiritual deep doctrine and instead they're saying oh this is carnal um our lineages are are the most important thing we can keep we've got to keep our lineages because that's how we keep our promises and our blessings and that's completely incorrect the the blessings of the fathers is not my father it's not a pharisee's father in christ time it has nothing to do with our carnal carnal lineage what happens when you partake of this new and everlasting covenant and you become baptized um, not just with uh water but with fire and with the holy ghost then heavenly father or and christ they take up the other side of that and they cleanse you and you become whose well now you become sons and daughters of christ that is your lineage that's the lineage that is spoken of so when they're saying the, the blessings of the fathers, they're not talking about this carnal line, which completely led almost all of the Israelites astray. They're talking about partaking of this new and everlasting covenant, broken heart, contrite spirit, and then the baptism of fire and baptism of the Holy Ghost that then brings you into the family of Christ and you become new. You're born again as a son or daughter of Christ. That is the only, those are the only people that get to partake of the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thank you. Thank you. And so continuing on with uh, the new and everlasting covenant, 
You read in Psalms, the Lord is nigh unto them that are broken heart and save as such as to be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in birth offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a, bro a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. And as I, Isaiah exclaims, for thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabited the eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy places, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. To this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my words. So this isn't an obscure teaching found in one or two scriptures in the Bible. Its theme and messages go throughout the Bible. And as when, when it's compiled, it's easier, easier seen um, as it's not just in a succinct order in the, in, the, in the Holy Bible. And so the last thing I'd like to bring up is Luke and Acts on the next slide. And we want to make sure we help all of us understand what that covenant is of the father, because you find it throughout the scriptures and the Holy or throughout the Holy Bible is the Israelites and the Jews reference back to we're the children of Abraham. Well, if you're the children of Abraham, what was Abraham trying to get you to do? Okay. And so Luke, Luke explains as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophet, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercies promised to our fathers. Well, what is that promise again? And to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham that he would grant unto us that we being delivered. We have to figure out what the fathers did and how they did it. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many has, have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thee shall, they, shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. That is speaking to us. That is speaking to our day. We are not disconnected from that. You see that yeah, same pattern. You see that same pattern. So these truths are in the Bible. And then by the time Christ comes, what happens? Patterns and parallels in all things. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we've got this pattern of, okay, these truths were understood. You see the people who actually bore the fruits of these covenants. They bore the fruits of them. They're there. They're very clear. It's not, a, I think I had a warm, fuzzy feeling. I must have been baptized by such and such. No, it's fire came down from heaven. It's angels were ministering. It's these incredible gifts that were portrayed over many different people. And, and then by the time you get to Christ's time, they don't understand any of that. All of this has been gutted. And it's, it's, and the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the other, the priests in the temple teach it or don't, don't teach it at all. Or they teach it to mean something carnal and not something um, that's very spiritual in the way that it was meant to. So what, how do we play that with us today? How did Joseph Smith treat these scriptures, not just in the Bible, but in the Book of Mormon? What if, and now how do we look at it today? So when you're going over these things with others, either in your family or who else you're trying to teach, when you go to the Book of Mormon, say, hey, this has been done before and go back to this. And you can see very clearly how this has been taken out. And it's very easy then to connect it with what has happened in our day. So to extend the looking to the fathers, this is from, this is knowing the father, how important it is to come to know the father. And this is in the gospel of truth. He is the one who set all in order and in whom the all existed and whom the all lacked as one of whom some have no knowledge. He desires that they know him, that they love him for what is it that the all lacked, if not the knowledge of the father, they hated him because they really were not wise men. After all these came also the little children, those who possess the knowledge of the father. When they became strong, they were taught the aspects of the father's face. They came to know they were known. And as you, so very clearly, it talks several times in here about seeing the father's face. And then you see later on where it was blasphemy to even consider seeing God in the Jewish time frame. People were stoned for that, okay? 
But those who were to be taught the living, who are inscribed in the book of the living, learn for themselves, receiving instruction from the Father, turning to him again. Since the perfection of the all is in the Father, it is necessary for the all to ascend to him. All the prophets in the Book of Mormon ascend up to the great mountain or to the, the high place, and they have these experiences. Therefore, if one has knowledge, he gets what belongs to him and draws it to himself. For he who is ignorant is deficient, and it is a great deficiency, since he lacks that which will make him perfect. Since the perfection of the all is in the Father, it is necessary for the all to ascend to him. Hence, if one has knowledge, he is from above. If he is called, he hears, he replies, and he turns towards him who called him. That sounds like broken heart, contrite spirit. If he is called, he hears, he replies, and he turns to him who called him. And he ascends to him, and he knows what he is called. Since he has knowledge, he does the will of him who called him. That's, that's the, the things that are given to you in Revelation. Um, as you go to the Father, the broken heart, contrite spirit, through the Holy Spirit, you are given through Revelation the things you need to do to enter into that covenant with the Lord. He desires to please him, and he finds rest. He receives a certain name. We know that that is something that happens when you, when you properly ascend. You receive a name. He who thus is going to have knowledge knows whence he came and whither he is going. He knows it is a person who, having become intoxicated, has turned from his drunkenness and having come to himself has restored what is his own. It has revealed his image. It has obtained his rest. Since this incompleteness came about because they did not know the father. So when they know the father, incompleteness from that moment on will cease to exist. As one's ignorance disappears when he gains knowledge and as darkness disappears when light appears, so also incompleteness is eliminated by completeness. And we know Joseph Smith taught no man can um, be saved any sooner than he gains knowledge. And this is very crystal clear to ascend, to see the face of God, to obey. Once you get that personal witness of Christ, then you're given your calling and your election. And then after you're obedient to that, then you're made perfect and complete because then you're like, you're calling elections made sure. This is very crystal clear. No wonder it was taken out. So on to the baptism of fire and water. So I'd like to pause there um, and always ask the question, is this something we desire? Do we want to go through the pains and struggles that Moses, Abraham, or the all night wrestle that Jacob did where his hip was literally broken by the glory of God and understand that this isn't a passive sit back in your chair path back to the father. Our heavenly father literally wants us to forsake all that we have, all that we know, all that we are and all that we are yet to be to receive this and coming to a proper understanding of our current state is is key to this because then we know what we have and what we don't have and what we need to seek after. Then we can start to recognize the blessings and promises in the scriptures that aren't really manifested in our life is due to the fact we haven't received these blessings or these promises. The carnal man likes to justify things and we like to accept contradictions purely on faith and we're saying well we have this but yet we don't manifest the fruit. It's not important. And then we try to justify it. We find a scripture that kind of backs it up and feeds our pride and our main ambition. But the fact is, is we need to be honest with ourselves. And if we are, we can simply see what we are missing. And that is a joyful thing to recognize our fallen state as joy, because then at that point, you can continue to search and seek and diligently pray and really have pure intent and a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And so if that's in fact what we want, we then go into the baptism of water and baptism of fire. And we under help and we want to understand that the baptism of water and the baptism of fire is two and sep- two separate things, two separate ordinances that take place throughout the scriptures and the, and the scriptures testify of these things. And the covenant that is made with our fathers is two part right? The first part is that we promise to come to him with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Well, what does he promise us? What is it that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob received? And they received a baptism of fire and baptism of the Holy Ghost. 
And from then they receive personal revelation on how they are to approach the Lord through the veil. And Christ did this on the cross when he was crucified and the veil was literally rent. The veil was made up of skin and our skin and our body is a veil. And when Christ broke that veil, it allowed us to receive that spirit, which is covered by the blood, to give us the individual revelation necessary to come unto Christ. That is the symbolism that, is, that takes place in the temple when Christ was crucified. And oftentimes, you'll want to draw on the symbolism of the tabernacle that Moses set up before us. on going from the outer courts to the inner courts to the Holy of Holies. And, and recognize the ascension path. And then also you can bring in, we like to bring in the creation to the, to, the, to the garden, to the fall outside of the garden. You fall back down and then you got to go back up to the temple. And because the Israelites didn't want to go up to Mount Sinai with Moses, Moses was left to give them a law and an opportunity to be taught on what to do in the symbolism. Okay, so our baptism of water, that is our carnal or outward expression. However, the baptism of fire and the baptism of the Holy Ghost as repeated throughout Scripture is authorized by Father only when advocated by Christ himself. And John explains this when he says, No man, no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. And this ordinance is performed with one in authority. In Acts, we see how the, the apostles laid their hands on them and received the Holy Ghost. And we see throughout Acts, that is a, a common practice by the apostles. And we like to bring in John the Baptist's testimony as well. He we says, well, when does John the Baptist receive the baptism of fire? And most Christians will be able to recognize it, that in the womb. And I was like, well, who performed that ordinance? And we have scripture references that, that an angel from the Lord performs that ordinances. And so this is something we strive to actively do. We can't, we can, we can all here who's sitting down and uh, hearing my voice can all go get baptized in the water tomorrow. That is something we can do regardless of where our heart is. However, this baptism of fire and baptism of the Holy Ghost is only authorized by the Father because we can't deceive christ we can't deceive the father we can't just assume that we received this and if we think we've already received it we will stop looking for it so this is the gateway to christ and we want to enter in ye at the straight gate because narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few be that find it that few be that find it is the few of those who will actually even read the scriptures so you have a small group of people that take the scriptures for their guide and that read them. And then you also have even a fewer of those people who will find what they are actually looking for. And so we strive to enter at this great gate for many will seek to enter in. We have many Christians, many people of the church throughout the world, regardless of the denomination that they, that they profess, that will seek to enter and they just won't be able to find it. And it's plainly laid out in, in the scriptures there in the in in the Luke, in Luke's account. Um, Melinda, do you have anything else to add to that? After your next slide. Okay, and so John the Baptist continues once again as we like to throw show this how it's not just an obscure doctrine, and this is found in Matt, Mark, and John in a similar fashion when Christ says or. John the Baptist says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So John the Baptist didn't even have this authority, and he recognized it, and he taught this openly. I indeed, again, baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And as we continue along going through the doctrine of Christ, the next verse in Luke is, is important, but we'll kind of come back to it. But just for reference sake, it says, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the shaft he will burn with fire and quenchable. And because this doctrine is being taught more so openly now, we recognize that we're in the time that the gathering has taken place. I can testify to 
all those that are on this call being led out to Ohio. We are literally being sent servants of the Lord to our doorsteps that are ready to receive these covenants and to be taught these things. And that people are setting up refuges in the stakes of Zion throughout the world in preparation for what's about to happen. And so if people are buying land and building farms and preparing for these days, how close are we? Now, we may not be able to directly reference a timeline, but we can recognize that people are literally leaving big cities. They are buying land just because they're working on their thoughts and impressions in their mind. And I love this because if you go to Hebrews 11, which is our faith chapter, right? And we like to look at Noah and think that he received this blueprint for building the ark. And this is something he did, you know, overnight. He didn't even question himself. It was super simple. The angel told him to build an ark, and so he wants to build it. But no, the, the Hebrews 11, 9, or 11, 7 says, By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteous, which is by faith. Okay. He didn't move with the blueprint given to him by an angel. He moved with fear, literally off the thoughts and intents or ideas that are placed into his mind. And that was, that's what separates the wheat and the tares. The wheat can hear the spirit and they act upon it. They may question it and stumble and hesitate, but it's the principle of doing that separates those two groups of people is literally we have people in this group and throughout the world that are moving with fear, buying land, building houses or farms for whatever reason. The Lord may have not manifested to them, but they're moving upon these thoughts and ideas. And, and so are we willing to do that? Same with Abraham in verse 8. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went. Why would we expect to be any different? Why do you think we're going to get told exactly why before we act? And the truth is, we're not going to. If we can't act upon our thoughts and the, and the ideas of our head as given to us by the Spirit, we are that unprofitable servant, are we not? Okay, and so Christ asked this question of all of us. And we kind of talked about it a little bit before, but are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? A lot of the understanding of the Christian religion is... is that the saints of God will be raptured out and they will avoid these times. And so that's why conforming to these mask mandates and the tyranny that's being pressed upon us is easy for them to accept because they think this too will pass. And it bothers me a little bit when I hear leaders of religious organizations using their pulpit to call the world to fast and repent that things will turn to normalcy. I've heard the word used normalcy and life turning to normal. And brothers and sisters, I think we can all recognize that this is not going to happen. And it puts us into a carnal all is well in Zion as, as Dustin just yelled out to us in the chat. And that's what it does. It, it rules us back to sleep. And then you have another using the pulpit saying this too will pass. And that's the title that he's preaching unto, unto us that this will pass. And I can say for myself, and I would almost invite us all to have the same testimony that this isn't going to pass. It's only going to get worse. And through this fire, through this calamities that will surely hit the world is where the saints of God are really purged and made clean, as we made reference to in a previous slide um, a couple slides ago. So we can look forward to this time to help yeah. us purge out the wickedness inside of us. Go ahead, babe. And, and that's what's so important about this last quote is you have um, the mother of, I think it's Zebedee and, and the brother. I, sorry if I'm spacing my names. I didn't get much sleep last night. But you've got the two of them or the mother coming and saying, hey, are, um, are they going to come and sit down 
on the right hand, you know, right hand and left hand of, of Christ. He, she's basically asking Christ, you know, where are they going to be? And Christ is like, are you able to drink the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I have? They've been baptized already, you guys. They've been baptized by John. Why would he say that? If this is referencing a water baptism and, you know, just not having to deal, do anything hard or difficult, why is he, Christ then telling them that they haven't been baptized yet? They haven't even partaken of a bitter cup yet. Christ knows what their, the disciples are going to have to endure. He knows what they're going to have to go through. And he's like, yeah, I, I can't say it. that's not up to me to give that. He basically says in the next verse, that's up to the father. I can't tell you what's going to happen because they have to prove themselves. So that's to all of us. Christ is speaking to each of us. Are you able to drink of the cup that he drank of? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism that he was baptized with? And there's an even deeper level to that. What happened to him in Gethsemane? He was baptized with water and with blood. And that's something you can just ponder on yourself. That's a whole nother level. But the reality is he was telling us very clearly that there is so much more that has to happen. And we've talked with a lot of people being out here who firmly believe in the rapture, firmly believe that that's going to happen. And what's interesting is they're partly correct. So make sure that when we're, when we're trying to talk with other people that we have the spirit because we realized we were telling someone, okay, that's not how the Lord works. The Lord wants us to um, prove ourselves with the whole reason to come down here in probation. And as Nathan and I were talking, we realized that partially what they're saying is correct because we know that when Zion's established, there will people that will go out and find those who are praying to be relieved from the bondage and the suffering that they're going to, that they're experiencing. And they will, in, in a sense, you could say, be raptured out, whereas they will be saved and they'll be brought to Zion. So there is a partial truth to that. And you just have to make sure you, you touch on that and explain it when you're talking, because that can be a real um, game changer when you're trying to discuss this and someone believes firmly, nope, I'm not going to have to deal with any of these things. So baptism continued. Now these, this is from the baptism A and B um, book. So there's, this is just part A. This is the fullness of the summary of knowledge, which summary was revealed to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. These are the sure and necessary items so that we may walk in them, but they are those of the first baptism. So first baptism, okay. It's, it's that they're meaning that there's more than one baptism. Most people believe I was baptized. I'm saved. I'm good water done right the first baptism is, is the forgiveness of sins and then there's a few words missing so i'll skip forward is the pattern of christ which is the equal for jesus moreover the first baptism in the, is the forgiveness of sins we are brought from those of the right that is into the imperishability which is the jordan so touching making pretty clear there that there's the first baptism which is just in, in, in relation to sins and acknowledging that we are sinful and fallen. Enoch 14.10, they elevated me aloft to heaven. I proceeded until I arrived at a wall built with stones of crystal, a vibrating flame surrounded it, which began to strike me with terror. And, and this is something I've been wanting to say for a while is if you get somebody that says that they had an experience, baptism of fire, baptism of Holy Ghost or ascension experience, and they just feel great and everything's wonderful and they're standing in the presence of Christ and they just, it's their best friend. That's completely false. <laughs> I, I, I'm not trying to demean anyone's wonderful experience. However, if you look, go to the scriptures, every single experience, look at Nephi, look at Lehi, look at Isaiah, look at all of these experiences. None of them run up and are buddy, buddy with Jesus and think everything's grand. It's, they're filled with terror. They realize how unworthy they are. They need to have sin purged from them. They feel like they're being burned alive. It's when you stand before a perfect being who has wrought the salvation of all creation, do you think you are in any way worthy to stand there? No, you fall to your, to the ground and you're burned alive. So right here, he's expressing Enoch himself, who was a man who was able to have a perfect city taken up into heaven is struck and stricken with terror into this vibrating flame I entered for each one loves truth because truth is the mouth of the father his tongue is the holy spirit so if truth is the mouth and the tongue is the holy spirit what is going to strike you it's the holy spirit that's what cleanses you who joins him to truth attaching him to the mouth of the father 
by his tongue at the time he shall receive the Holy Spirit. So as we seek the Holy Spirit and we receive it, then we become one with the Father and we're able to hear and obey and move forward. And this goes back to the broken heart contrite spirit in Acts and the martyrdom of the Holy Apostle Andrew. The blessed Andrew said, if thou believest with all thy heart, thou shalt be able to learn. But if thou believest not, thou shalt not by any means attain the idea of such truth. So you have to be believing and willing to act. Like Nathan was saying, those thoughts and ideas that come to you that just seem silly and small and insignificant, act on them. Start acting on those. Then the blessed Andrew, having in adjourned the people, said, I entreat you earnestly, brethren, that I may first, okay, I'm going to stop for a second. Have any of you noticed how long these verses are? Some of these verses are really long. You don't see that a lot. You see like broken, kind of um, confusing uh, Bible entries so much. And you're like, what did that just say? Look how clear and concise this is. It's kind of like the Book of Mormon, isn't it? It's pretty, pretty pure and pretty easy to understand. So then, uh, let's see, um, I entreat you earnestly, brethren, that I may first make one prayer to my Lord, so then set about releasing me. All the people therefore kept quiet because of the adjuration. Then the blessed Andrew with a loud cry said, do not permit, O Lord, thy servant at this time to be removed from thee, for it is time that my body be committed to the earth, and thou shalt order me to come to thee, thou who givest eternal life, my teacher, whom I have loved, whom on this cross I confess, whom I know, whom I possess, receive me, O Lord. And as I have confessed thee and obeyed thee, so now in this word, hearken to me. And before my body come down from the cross, receive me to thyself, that through my departure there may be access to thee of many of my kindred, finding rest for themselves in thy majesty. When therefore he had said this, he became in the sight of all glad and exulting, for an exceeding splendor like lightning coming forth out of heaven shone down upon him. And so encircled him that in consequence of such brightness, mortal eyes could not look upon him at all. And the dazzling light remained about the space of half an hour. And when he had thus spoken and glorified the Lord still more, the light withdrew itself and he gave up the ghost. And along with the brightness itself, he departed to the Lord and giving him thanks. So Andrew's being crucified. He's in the middle of being murdered for teaching and preaching the gospel. And what happens? He offers up a broken heart and a contrite spirit. He's praying for the people that he's suffering for. And he's telling God, I love you. I trust you. All this stuff that I'm experiencing. And he's like, don't kill me yet. I want to bear witness. He's saying, put off death. Let me keep getting, um, um, sitting up here being suffering this horrific, you know, um, torture. And I'm going to confess you. And I'm also going to pray for my family and others that they will receive of the same glory and love and beauty that I am getting to um to receive through my relationship with Christ having partaken of the new and everlasting covenant and so he has that broken heart contrite spirit he's praying for for others so it's charity almost all the people who are called up to the to heaven to witness Christ look in the book of Mormon they're not sitting there going okay I want to see Christ I'm gonna meditate and I'm gonna really focus and I'm gonna get to see Christ isn't that kind of prideful isn't that kind of selfish Almost all of them are praying for other people. Lehi is praying for his people um, and they never expect it. And Nephi is praying to understand his dad and then praying for his people. They don't expect it. And all of a sudden it just happens. It's through charity. It's through love. It's, it's through humility. It's never through pride. It's never through, I'm going to get to see someone. I'm going to get to have this spiritual experience. None of them expect it. Look at the patterns in the scriptures of these great spiritual experiences. And that's what you measure against. That's the fruit. So at the very end, after he offers this broken heart and contrite spirit, this beautiful prayer to the Lord, um, asking for even his pain and suffering to remain, then lightning from heaven, everybody sees it. It's not a warm, fuzzy feeling he gets inside. It's obvious to everyone there. And it lasts for over half an hour. And then he gives up the ghost. It's so beautiful. And then you've got the seal and baptism through Christ. These are other things. Where do you hear about Christ sealing anything on anyone? Guess what? It was in the Bible. It's all throughout the Bible. It was just taken out. So you've got the epistle of the apostles, John, Thomas, Peter, Andrew, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Bartholomew uh, Matthew, Nathaniel, Judas, Zealots, and um, they go into this part right here. For verily I say unto you, whosoever shall hear you and believe on me shall receive the light of the seal through me and baptize through me. Ye shall be fathers and servants and masters. Interesting. And ye shall be called servants because they shall receive the baptism of life. 
and the remission of their sins at my hand through you. That's two different baptisms, a baptism of life and of remission of sins. According to the type, so some of the words are missing this, but it is fitting for you at this time to send thy son, Jesus Christ, and anoint, again, anoint us so we might be able to trample upon the snakes and, and the heads of the scorpions and all the power of a devil since he is a shepherd of the seed. Through him, we have known thee and we glorify thee. Glory be to thee, the Father in the Son, the Son in the Father, the Father in the Holy Church and in the holy angels. From now he abides forever in the perpetuity of the eons forever until the untraceable eons of the eons, amen. And in the gospel of truth, another book. For this reason, they have been troubled. Speak about Christ in their midst so that they may receive a return and he may anoint them with ointment the ointment is the pity of the father who will have mercy on them. But those whom he has anointed are those who are perfect for the filled vessels are those which are customarily used for anointing. So a parable there talking you back about the vessels. So the talking of Christ coming and anointing, Christ, Christ coming and sealing was all known in the first couple centuries after Christ's death and while he was on the earth because he taught it and it's been completely gutted. Can you go to the next slide? We're going to switch the seek you this Jesus and the promise. Um, but what I want to do is I want to pause right there due to the fact um, through experience and teaching this, we have found that sometimes it takes a couple days or a couple different conversations to understand the baptism of fire and the baptism of water. And so on Saturday, this past Saturday, um, I walked into to a, a prayer breakfast where I was asked to kind of share some of my thoughts and had about 25 to 30 minutes. Fortunately, we have more time here, so it's easier to get into it in detail. But the Lord, I was praying to have the spirit with me because I knew I couldn't teach without it. And the Lord kind of told me, he's like, no, you're, you're going to kind of fail a little bit. And I was like, all right, you're going to have some resistance. And so you will find if you can help focus on one point of doctrine, um, one idea at a time and help them fully understand it, it's easier to connect them. But trying to connect all these ideas in, in one sitting to someone who's not accustomed to them may prove difficult. And so having that spirit and learning how to teach this from the Bible. And you can almost, I, I don't want to, you know, say anything bad about what Malia has added to the slide deck, but this is found in the Bible and you can say, you can remain true and faithful to the Bible as it is written to point some of these out to build that base. And so after we understand our condemnation, what the promises of the fathers and the two parts to that covenant through the baptism of water, and baptism of fire, we then move into seeking ye this Jesus and the importance of seeking the face of the Lord and understanding and believing that this is possible. Believing that you can literally enter into the presence of the Lord. And you will find more people than you would think that are actually seeking this. And even on Sunday, I had this, this I guess he used to be a pastor. He's kind of has a smaller congregation now because, because some of the things he's teaching and he is dead set on seeking the face of the Lord. He's like, two, three years ago, it's been put into my mind, and I want nothing but this. And this is what he's telling to me, sharing his desires. Like, I want to find, find the face of the Lord. I know we can do it. And we just got to get rid of these traditions that we have. And so it's exciting when you come across someone who, who um, has this, those desires in them already rooted inside them. Because in Chronicles and Deuteronomy, we kind of we find this: the Spirit of God come upon Azariah. The Lord is with you, while ye be with him. And if ye seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. It goes back to that actively doing and seeking, rather than this passive pronouncement of of a carnal salvation just by mere belief. So if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. If thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all, and when thou art in tribulation and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days. So this applies to us. And the implication here 
is that there will be tribulations that enter our lives. And these are the, the very experiences that are necessary for us to seek him with a full purpose of heart. Knock and it shall be opened to you. Seek and you shall find. And they're familiar with this terminology. So if we turn to the Lord thy God and shall be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of the Father which he sware unto them. And once again, what is that covenant? And that is the broken heart and the contrary spirit. And that he will baptize us with fire and with the Holy Ghost. Because here is our promise. We go back one slide, sweetheart. The Savior gives us a promise to those of the covenant. And Luke states, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry you in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And what is that power? That's the power of the first comforter of the Holy Ghost. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witness unto me unto the uttermost part of the earth. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whosoever I have said unto you. Well, what does that mean? He will bring all things to our remembrance? We, we like to bring in the impact and the blessings of having the Spirit and having the Holy Ghost that you will speak with the, the mouth of angels and that you will receive power from on high to do these things when you receive these blessings. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth forth from the Father, he shall testify of me, and you also shall bear witness. And a study of the Holy Ghost throughout the, the New Testament would take you hours and pages of, of citations um, just in Acts alone. Every chapter makes mention of the Holy Ghost and also a relation of what bears fruit. And so when we post this slide deck, you'll actually have a couple chapters in Acts of all the Holy Ghost references. Um, but for the sake of tonight's meeting, we'll kind of wrap it up here in a minute. Um, but this is the promise that we have. And we clearly lay it out for you. If then, it's the if, you know, you come to him with a broken heart, then you receive the Holy Ghost, and here's the blessings of those things. Babe, did you have anything you wanted to add here? Well, in the chat, there's talking about martyrs. And what I always find that so, so interesting is because even in the Bible and Revelations, it specifically says that they can't, the, as the angels are, are calling up for everything to, to end, for the Lord to just reap down and stop all the evil, um, he says no. There's, there's many more that have to die um, for my name. And they receive um, white robes, you know, robes of righteousness. And, and it's not like a few. It's thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands more in that time frame die. And that hasn't even happened yet. That's, you know, so there's, there's just because people are talking about in the chat, I just wanted oh. to say, that's not even something you really have to reach for. It, it's, it's clearly laid out. So, um, thank you. Seek you this Jesus. Yeah. So, what is going on and why is this so important to us? Well, is there an echo? Can you hear an echo? Or is that just me? Okay, the gathering. So whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his fours and gather his wheat into the gardener, but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. I will accept you with a sweet savior when I bring you out from the people and gather you out from the countries wherein you have been scattered and I will sanctify in you. So those who receive this covenant, those who are on that path of listening to the spirit will be gathered out. And that is taking place as we, as we mentioned um, a little bit earlier and using the spirit of discernment as you're showing these things is oftentimes you can bring, you can bring in a lot of the, the resources as the spirit directs us and, highlight B and C 86 as you talk about the parable of the wheat and the tares. But here as found in Matthew, it says, but while men sleep, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. 
well, who are the enemy? And who are these men that slept? And these men were, in fact, the leaders of the church. And who is the enemy? The enemy is, in fact, Satan, the great Lucifer. And he sowed tares among the wheat. And so we're talking about the church here. The church as a whole has the gospel. However, tares are literally sown inside the, inside the church. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. And what is this blade that's being referenced? And we understand from the scriptures that the blade is the sword, it's the truth. It's that dividing um, mechanism that separates the wheat and the tares. And so as further light and knowledge is shed upon a group of people, it will either harden your heart as a tear or strengthen your testimony in Christ as a wheat. But we must, be grow, we must grow up together in righteousness um, or else the wheat will fall as well. And so the blade springs up amongst us and brought forth fruit. Then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the household came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in the field from whence then hath it tares? And he said unto him, An, an enemy has done this. So we got to recognize that the enemy inside the church sows these tares. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? And he said, Nay. Least ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let them both grow together and tell the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And so, brothers and sisters, as we, can, as we conclude here, um, we, like to help to, we like to understand that the, that the wheat are being gathered out as we speak. And this is something that's incurring in our day at this time. And that those who receive the Spirit will know where to go and where to be led. And that the servants of the Lord are on this earth uh, preparing for this time. And babe, you want to add anything to that? I think that's what's been really interesting. Nathan and I had a conversation a little while ago and he, he was basically saying, well, you know, how do I get someone to accept, you know, um, these greater truths if I can't even get them to look at the Book of Mormon? And as we were talking about this together, we came to the conclusion that the Book of Mormon is the most pure form of the doctrine of Christ that we have, which is why it's the most correct book on the earth. If you can teach the doctrine of Christ, then that does it, okay? That people ascending, understanding that covenant and receiving it, acting and receiving it, they don't even need to know that the Book of Mormon exists. Now, we want them to know because there's so many more truths and so many more things that head up that, but once they um, offer up the broken heart contrite spirit and the father comes in and he um, takes up the other side of that covenant, now they have a direct link with the Lord. And if they're true and faithful to that, they're going to follow the spirit. And they, if the Lord needs them to, to know the book of Mormon and to know Joseph Smith is a Davidic servant and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then he will. It's super simple. And so sometimes we go, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to share this with this person because then they're going to go, oh, I'm a Mormon or I don't want to say this or, or they're totally in the box and I don't want to share this. It all comes down to the doctrine of Christ same yesterday, today, and forever um, that Christ is our savior that we come to him there is no servant at the gate there is no person doing an interview behind a desk to see if we're worthy and now we're sealed up to eternal life and we just sit back and make sure we pay our tithing i'm sorry to say that but that's not how it works there is no servant at the gate no one can know your heart no one can know who you are what your desires are no one can purify you no one can witness before the father for you except for the one and only person who cannot lie, and that is Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer. That can be taught to go to him through a broken heart and contrite spirit and to receive of the new and everlasting covenant clearly and simply through all the scriptures that have been given by following the spirit and through study and prayer. And that's the most important thing that we have learned here. I, I used to think, no, I've got to get you to accept this. You have to accept this scripture. And, and that's not absolute. Follow the spirit, teach what, 
the spirit guides you to teach, you don't know what those people need to hear for them to offer up that broken heart contrite spirit, because that's the end goal is for them to do that, for them to act in faith and go to their savior. It's not for them to come to us or to go to anyone else. And that's the doctrine of Christ. And as we've studied that together as a couple, we've come to know that so deeply. And it's just beautiful to know that our Heavenly Father has given every people on this earth this doctrine in its pure form. So as we prayed about this, the Lord showed me in section 18 and brought that to my remembrance. And he says to Oliver Cowdery, Behold, I have manifested unto you by my spirit in many instances that the things which you have written are true, wherefore you know that they are true. And if you know that they are true, behold, I give unto you a commandment that you rely upon the things which are written. For in them are all things written concerning the foundation of my church, my gospel, and my rock. Wherefore, if you shall build up my church upon the foundation of my gospel and my rock, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. To reiterate Malia's testimony that I know and I testify that if we teach these things as written from the Holy Scriptures, that we will not fail. And once again, that is in Doctrine and Covenants 18, 2 through 5. And that was an answer given by the Lord when we were struggling on how to teach these things. And for those of that, you that might have missed it at the beginning of this Zoom call, is... I made mention in reference to an idea, and this is just Nate's idea that's been placed into my head two days ago, that the day of the Gentiles, if it has not already came to an end, is at an end. And the Gentiles are those of the Latter-day Saints. And so this gospel and this doctrine will need to be teach to all of God's servants. And those that will be found of, in Zion are from all nations, all kindreds, and all tongues, like the scriptures say. It plainly says that which implies every religion, every denomination. It is those that hear the voice. And so when Malia says that, you know, that you, you can teach it and the saints will hear his voice and they will receive it with gladness. That's exactly what it is. You just, you, you learn it. You try to teach it the best you can. You stumble over yourself and um, you continue pressing forward. And so, um, in conclusion, and to kind of wrap things up, I, I leave you with my testimony that the doctrine of Christ is, is all throughout the Bible. Um, and it might take a little more work, but it's, it's in there. And as you teach those things and led by the Spirit, I think it provides us an opportunity to also bear testimony of some of the scriptures that Malia brought up today, um, as well as uh, the Book of Mormon. And we'll open it up for questions. I think that's Dustin. Is that your hand? 